All right. So welcome to the closing keynote. How was your DevOps up to now? Yeah, you had a good time? Great. So as I've mentioned in the opening, everything is recorded. Um, tomorrow you will have already all the talks from today as well, so you don't have to miss a thing. Um, and then of course at eight o'clock we will open the doors and have the movie. And then tomorrow, it's still a very busy day, even if it's only half a day, all the rooms are often packed on Friday. So uh, make sure you don't drink too much beer if you want to attend some sessions tomorrow morning. Cool. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next keynote. As I mentioned in the, keynote, in the opening keynote, I read an article of Barrett um, online. I was, I was blown away and I tried to reach out through different channels and luckily you replied and actually were Through interested LinkedIn in doing... message, actually. Exactly. The so. magic of the, of the social web. Absolutely. So it's all yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. You're applauding before I've even started. This is going well. Um, so I'm here today to talk about how this turned into this. So I wanted to, before we get started, I want to do a quick show of hands. Who in the audience uh, considers themselves to be an extrovert? Okay, a couple of you. Yeah, we got a few in the front here. They're all in the front row. That's ironic. Um, how, about, how about an ambivert? An ambivert, kind of like a mix between the two. Okay, got a couple more, a couple more. Who here considers themselves to be an introvert? Uh, yeah, a lot of hands there. So, like many of you, Mark Zuckerberg also considers himself to be an introvert. Um, and in a lot of ways, that introversion has been one of his biggest assets. It's really helped him uh, to have the vision and determination and singular focus to build Facebook. And who else but an introvert really could build a, a software setup that allows you to talk to someone on the other side of the world or to track your, the lives of your friends and family without actually being there in person or to organize an entire community all without ever having to have a face-to-face -face conversation. But in a lot of ways, that introversion has also been his biggest weakness. It's kept him from anticipating the long-term social and cultural effects of the platform. He's consistently underestimated his responsibility and his impact on the world. And as a result, there were no protections in place to keep the world's most powerful tool from, for connecting from being hijacked and turned into the world's most powerful tool for manipulation. So I, was an in, I am also an introvert. I would consider myself an introvert. Um, but I was lucky enough to grow up attending a tech conference that my, working on a tech conference that my family puts on is called Future in Review. And it brings together top uh, technologists every year and science, scientists and filmmakers and um, to talk about where technology and the economy and the political space are headed in the next five to 10 years. And through going to this conference every year, I taught myself how to be less of an introvert to the extent that I'm actually now semi-comfortable standing up here talking to this huge room full of people. Um, and the other thing that I learned from this experience was that all of these top technology executives and the intelligence community and the military communities, they all depend on science fiction authors to help them understand and foresee the future. Um, and so for that reason, about a year and a half ago, I started a different company called Scout.ai. And the goal of that was to democratize this service that top technologists and military and intelligence officials had been using for years to help them understand and anticipate what was coming, um, and to bring that to the broader tech community. Um, so unfortunately, right away, it started working. Um, <clears throat> so this is an article that we published back in June. And it was inspired by, I don't know if anyone remembers, there was this big kind of to-do about Facebook's uh, trending stories category, which is just like three little bullets on the top right corner of the Facebook news feed. And, you know, the more that we thought about that, we were like, well, that's stupid because trending stories takes up this teeny tiny little corner. If someone really wanted to manipulate you or to, to be biased, they would use the news feed. Like that big central feed that takes up every the majority of your screen space. 
Um, and so we started talking to, we developed some internal sources at Facebook and at Google, and we were able to reverse engineer their code approval process. And what we found is that because they have such a developer-friendly culture, um, any two developers working together could actually change the newsfeed algorithm itself in a way that could materially affect the outcome of an election without anyone else at the company or any of the leadership actually knowing it. Um, and at this point, Facebook had already come out uh, publicly and announced a study that they had done where they were actually able to improve voter turnout just by showing users, like, I voted stickers from their friends in their newsfeed. So it was not beyond the realm of possibility in our minds that someone, you know, some internal actor could uh, decide that, you know, to save the United States from Trump uh, and shift the algorithm just a little bit so that those in, people in swing states uh, would be cons you know, encouraged to vote uh, more on the liberal side than on the conservative side. And we actually wrote some science fiction to illustrate how this might work. Um, so then the election happened in the U.S., and it turned out a little differently than that. Um, and right away, I kind of started to get really interested in this. It seemed like there was something kind of weird going on. Um, so the first thing that kind of stuck out to me just, just right off the bat was there was this big difference between um, the historical margin of error uh, within exit polls and the 2016 exit poll totals, particularly in key swing states in the U.S. And what that means is that like for the last four elections before this, there was always less than 3% margin of error between what people, who people said they voted for when, when they, voted, when they uh, registered their vote in exit polls and how the, the actual vote turned out. And on top of that, we already knew because um, we'd been told in October before the election uh, that Russia had been trying to interfere in the outcome of the election by hacking into a bunch of emails. Um, so we, we embarked on this great research project. Um, and the, the outcome of that research project was this article, which Stefan just mentioned, The Rise of the Weaponized AI Propaganda Machine. And what we found was that there was actually this global action, electioneering platform that was deployed in the US election for probably the first time ever. Um, and there are like several parties that contributed to this and that, that used the platform. Um, and they had overlapping goals. So they all worked well together. Uh, and I'm gonna talk you through a few of, of those. Um, but there are really three key uh, tenets of, or, or uh, technological underpinnings of this platform. So the first one is what I call summoning the moths to the flame. Um, and essentially, this is SEO hacking to attract and track suitable targets. So one of the first researchers that I connected with when I started looking into this was a guy named Jonathan Albright. And Jonathan Albright had, had scraped the web and found that during the campaign, there, was actually, uh, there were actually two net news networks going on. So what you see right here in the middle of this giant cloud is all of the, the traditional news sources that you would expect to be linked to a lot on the web. Um, but there was also this shadow network uh, of alt-right propaganda sites that was specifically designed to game search engine optimization. And what would happen is that these sites could link to each other. Many of them were just like simple Wix sites or Tumblrs. Um, but they were automated so that they could link to each other within seconds and therefore changing uh, which sites came up first in search, in search engine results and also what was trending on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, and those sites specifically were linking back to primarily these, um, these red bubbles. So Breitbart, the Daily Caller, the Daily Mail, a lot of them were linking to RT. That was a little fishy in my mind. Um, the Russian propaganda site. Um, and so the result is that any time bad news came out about Trump during the U.S. election, uh, they could spin a new story up and then automatically popularize that story just by linking it out through this automated propaganda network. 
So this whole system actually served two roles. The first, you know, is the search engine optimization. But all of these sites in in the network, in the propaganda network, were actually also equipped with cookies. Not surprising. Um, but the cookies let them track who was clicking on which articles and which topics they were most interested in. Um, which brings me to the next part of this propaganda machine, turning voters into disinformation agents. So uh, because they were able to, to track who was interested in what, they could then use those cookies to remarket to these voters on Facebook. Uh, using dark ads. And dark ads were interesting because unlike traditional political advertising, uh, they can only be seen by the people who actually have them in their news feeds. So normally the FEC in the United States tracks political advertising and they make sure that you know they're saying who paid for the ad and they can track the content of the ad, they can make sure they're not... Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess they don't really stop people from lying, but uh, that's kind of the idea. It's like a general ethics patrol. Um, <clears throat> so, but in this case, that wasn't happening. And because it was on Facebook, and for the first time ever in this election, ironically enough, Facebook gave its advertisers the ability to target via zip code. Um, and so what that meant is that for the first time, the Trump campaign uh, and, and Russian sources as well could actually very specifically target swing states and key districts in swing states that they thought were more likely to flip one way or the other. And on top of that, not only could they just target those swing states, but they could A-B test anywhere between, they were, they were testing anywhere between 30 and 50,000 ads every day. Um, and on top of that, there was one day, like during the third presidential debate, where they tested 175,000 versions of an ad. Um, so the whole goal with this architecture was to get people, get voters activated and to rope them into these uh, bigger communities online, generally to get them to like some kind of Facebook page uh, or to join a group so that they could continue serving them content and ads and they would then start spreading that content or those ads themselves, um, preferably organically because then they don't have to pay for it. Um, and the interesting thing about this was... Um, so at least in the case of Russia, in the case of Russia, they would actually these groups were mostly targeted at cultural groups or cultural issues, much less than um, specific political candidates or campaigns. And it's the groups were not exactly what you would expect. So there were a lot of kind of like raw, raw, red blood, U.S. patriot groups. There were a couple of, like, Texas defend our borders or, like, no one can take my gun away groups. But there were also groups for uh, Black Lives Matter activists. There were groups, there was a group for the LGBTQ community. Um, and the broader strategy there was not just to, like, rope people in and feed them misinformation, but actually to start to pit these groups against each other. And so what you're seeing here on the screen is, is two different sides of a protest being organized by Russian propaganda. So on the one side, we have Stop the Islamization of Texas, um, and they're calling everyone to go to this rally on May 21st, 2016. And then on the other side, we have the Save Islamic Knowledge, and that was also a Russian ad that was trying to rally the opposite s side of the, of the protest. Um, and so what happened is this. There actually was a protest. Ironically, you know, we've got the nice Confederate flags, very loving. Um, on the other side, we've got these peace on earth signs. And it was very successful in not just mobilizing voters and, and kind of like roping them into these communities and networks, but also in pitting different cultural groups against each other and creating more tension and more hatred and more frustration all throughout the United States. So I'm not, I'm not trying to like abstain us from responsibility here, but I'm just saying it, you know, there, there was more at play than, than just what meets the eye. So the third part of this is deploying bot armies. Um, and I first learned about this through a researcher named uh, uh, Sam Woolley, who is the head of comp 
Oxford's Computational Propaganda Project. And Sam and his research partner, Phil Howard, actually started researching bots during the Arab Spring. And they were tracking bots because they thought they were interesting. And they thought it was, they were, sorry, they, they were tracking Twitter usage as it was used in revolution because they thought it was really interesting that people were able to use Twitter to organize um, and to create these so social and political movements. Um, but they started noticing that there were all of these other Twitter profiles coming in and spreading fake information and trying to actually... Um, you know, send people to the wrong places, giving people bad information about what was going on where or who was doing what. Um, and so they started tracking these misinformation uh, bots. And what they found is that the same network of bots uh, that was using the Arab Spring was actually deactivated and then reactivated several years later with different names and different profile pictures during the Brexit campaign. Um, so then that same network of bots was deactivated and then reactivated during the U.S. election with American names and American profile pictures. So a lot of these bots um, are automated and they look something like this and they're designed just to respond to keywords, right? Um, or to retweet specific candidates' tweets just to make them seem more popular. Um, but the most effective bots are actually operated manually. And what that means is that there are actually contractors uh, both independently, working independently, and um, within governments that their entire job is they create and maintain networks of fake profiles on Facebook and Twitter. And they do this because it's hard to actually maintain a valuable bot network because they have, you know, like in order to, to really really, you know, convince Facebook and Twitter that you're a, not a bot. Uh, you have to maintain a friend network. You have to respond to actual um, tweets. You, you know, you need someone to be the human behind the bot so you can engage in conversations. Um, and, and they're used for a really wide variety of things. They're used uh, to prop up candidates, as I mentioned. They're used to kind of like take over hashtags of, of the opposite candidate. Um, they're used to attack journalists. There was a journalist in, in Finland uh, who reported on uh, Russia's Internet Research Agency, which is the building where they house all of the people that operate their bot networks. Um, and she was then subject to uh, a very long and extended, att like, basically attack online where all of these articles were published about her uh, she was constantly attacked on Twitter. She was threatened, on and on and on. So, um, and then the other thing that they use these bots for is to comment on major news sites. So sites like the Washington Post or the New York Times, especially in the United States, where um, you know it's generally a well-respected news source. They'll then go into stories that might be negative, like that might be negative coverage of their candidate, and they'll try to undermine and undercut the story itself. Um, so the whole goal is just to change the narrative around and confuse people and start arguments and mo more and more and more of the confusion and division strategy. So um, both sides actually did use bots in, in the U.S. campaign, um, but there was a little bit of a discrepancy between who used more of them. Um, and in the last few weeks of the U.S. presidential campaign, Trump bots outnumbered Hillary bots five to one. Now, we know now that that was because Russia was also operating a lot of Trump bots. Um, and most recent estimates, uh, they keep changing, it's hard to keep track, but most recent estimates uh, from today, actually, there's a new kind of analysis of, of numbers, is that they reached about 150 million Americans on Facebook and about 145 million uh, Amer or users on Instagram. And that's, I would say that's a pretty, still a pretty conservative estimate. Um, so here's what this means. Silicon Valley really spent the last 10 years building digital addiction machines. And in 2016, Trump, Russia, and the alt-right hijacked them to try to change the outcome of the U.S. election. And this isn't just, it's not just fake news. They're actually like getting these people and roping them into these uh, disinformation networks. And as Jonathan Albright said, they're capturing people and then keeping them on an emotional leash and never letting them go. 
I've had a lot of friends in the United States tell me stories about how they don't understand why their parents or their aunts or their uncles have changed so much politically in the last few years, um, where they would have, you know, they they had previously been much more um, politically aligned to the left and have swung much further right. And it's just like, they don't understand where these ideas are coming from. They don't understand why they change so much. Um, and that's the thing that, there was an article actually just today, um, I think, or, or yesterday, about this group of, of uh, this town in Pennsylvania in the United States, many of whom voted for Trump. And the reporter went back, uh, you know, like almost a, a year later, uh, and interviewed them and, and asked them about, you know, how's he doing? Has he done these things that you thought he was going to do? Did he build the wall? Like, do you still like him even though he didn't build the wall? And they haven't changed. Like, no, nothing about his, his actual job performance has, has changed their opinion. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about why that is, but... I, it's really important to understand that this is not just something that happened in the past. This is an ongoing uh, manipulation of opinions and ideas. Um, so let's talk about who's behind this. So on the Trump side, this is a guy named Robert Mercer. And Robert Mercer um, is, was the largest donor to Trump's campaign. He was also the biggest investor in a company called Cambridge Analytica, which was the one that was running all of those A-B uh, ads during the campaign and roping people into those Facebook groups for, on, on behalf of the Trump campaign. Um, and he's also the biggest invest, or one of the biggest investors in, a, in Breitbart News, which is one of the main news companies that was kind of the bullhorn for Trump in the U.S., um, so in addition to that, uh, Mercer is a billionaire. He made his money, uh, he's an AI savant. He made his money as at Renaissance Capital pioneering um, the algorithmic trading industry. Um, and he's pretty reclusive. Like, I don't know if that he's ever actually given an interview to anyone ever in his life. He's actively avoids that. So the only way that we actually know really like who he is or what he believes is mostly from talking to um, fellow co-workers that he used to work with at Renaissance. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to share a few of the things that, that they have said about him. Um, so he doesn't believe in climate change. He's downplayed the dangers of nuclear war. He basically doesn't think that um, nuclear fallout or radiation is that harmful, and we shouldn't be worried about it. Um, he hates the Republican establishment, interestingly enough. But even more than the Republican establishment, he hates Hillary Clinton. Um, and he believes that she was actually part of a drug running scheme with the CIA and has had many of her opponents murdered. Um, he also believes that black people in the US were better off before the civil rights movement. Um, but perhaps his most defining belief, as, as defined by his coworkers, is that he believes in like teeny tiny government, as in no government at all whatsoever. Um, and I wanted to share this quote with you because I think it really illustrates, I get a lot of questions about like, who is this guy and why would he want to undermine the US government or why would he want to undermine democracy in the US? This is why. Um, he also, well, one last fun fact and then, and then we'll move on. Um, he, he also believes that people are direct the, the value of a person is directly related to their income or the amount of money they're able to raise. So he actually um, believes that those who are receiving any kind of state support or services are actually a, a negative value on, um, on, as, as humans, essentially, um, which is a, also feeds into the like, really, really, really small, small government aspect. Um, and so he's basically the architect of this network, Breitbart, uh, Cambridge Analytica and, uh, you know, the Trump campaign, which he kind of just like hopped on board with because it happened to be the campaign that was winning. He was actually supporting one of the other candidates before. But the, the reason that I think he's so important for, for everyone to understand is because he, you know, he's funded a lot of the white nationalists in the United States, Milo Yiannopoulos, um, Steve Bannon was his pick. He brought him in to, to help Trump, uh, 
run things. Um, and he, Steve actually left recently, uh, went back to uh, Breitbart News, and he did a really interesting Fox interview recently where he said, in 2018, which is the next time the U.S. is going to elect a major round of representatives, um, we're going to, these are not his exact words, but, but the gist of it was, we're going to just screw over all of the Republican candidates, this, the ex existing Republican um, politicians, except for, um, oh God, I'm going to get this wrong. I think it was Rand Paul. No, maybe Ted Cruz. It was Ted Cruz. Yeah. Um, so Ted Cruz is safe. Every, everyone else in the U.S. is not safe. Um, and then what that essentially means is that they're planning to take this network that they used this year in this election and to put it, uh, bring it to, to, to bear on this next round of elections. So this is something that they're building up and it gets stronger the more data that they, that they integrate into it. Um, so the other person that I want to talk about is Vladimir Putin. So Vladimir Putin, I had, you know, at first I was a little bit more confused about like, why would Russia uh, take this big risk of trying to interfere in the U.S. election? Like, what if they got caught and there was some kind of retaliation by the U.S. or NATO? Um, it just seemed, it just seemed uh, not in necessarily in their interest. Uh, but then I started doing some research about recent uh, Russian history, and everything started to make a lot more sense to me. So... Let's flash back to 2014. Now, it's important to understand that Russia is, you know, maybe not so much as a country as an oil and gas company with a standing army. By which I mean that um, their entire economy depends on oil and gas. It makes up 52% of federal budget revenue. That means that's a lot. Um, and the oligarchs, the, the rich uh, Russians who control everything and tell everyone what to do, um, most of them, if not all of them, are connected in some way to Russian oil companies. And in fact, when Putin um, stepped down as uh, uh, president a, a few years ago, he would, went on and was placed in this kind of fake presidency where someone else was president, but he was really running the show, and he was also running an oil and gas company in Russia. So... There are a lot of things mixed up uh, for him, for Putin, in, in the oil and gas industry. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to think, to think like him, really, to, to like start, try and start to get, get into that mind space of what it's like to be that. And if you're Putin, like, you really don't have a lot of options if you're not president anymore. Like, it's, you're in a pretty good spot. You can do whatever you want. You can try and, you know, keep trying to find new avenues for uh, political power or expression. Um, so in 2014, he was having kind of a rough time. The economy in Russia was not doing very well. And people were kind of upset about it because it wasn't very much fun for them to live there. Um, the price of oil was at an all-time low. Uh, and the Paris Climate Accord was about to go in effect, which means that there would have been this they were about to experience even more transition away from oil and gas. Um, at the same time, they had just invaded Ukraine, and so Russia was experiencing the second largest citizen protest since the fall of the Soviet Union. So Putin was in a pretty tight spot. He didn't have any money. He, didn't, he had all these people revolting. They were demanding democracy. Um, and he was about, things were about to get worse. They were only about to get worse. And that was the point at which the United States decided to impose sanctions against Russia. And so those sanctions actually were, were in retaliation for their invasion of Ukraine. But what they did was they blocked a $500 billion oil deal in the Arctic Sea between ExxonMobil and Rosneft, one of the biggest oil and gas companies in Russia. Now, $500 billion, that's, that's a lot of money. And in fact, this was if it had gone through... This would have been the biggest business deal, as far as I know, um, in the history of the world. Like, the biggest business deal ever. So, when you're out of money and everyone's revolting and suddenly, like, the biggest business deal in the world gets blocked, you're not going to be really in a great mood. And at that point, Putin, um, you know, got kind of, kind of uh, as far as I can tell, 
I wouldn't say went underground, but he kind of retreated a little bit with some of his top guys, and they tried to figure out what to do. And a couple months later, probably about five or six months later, they came back out and did three major interviews um, with the media in Russia and the surround and surrounding area. And those three interviews laid out their new approach to foreign policy with regards to the United States, um, which was essentially, as they explained it, a new Cold War. So at that point, they, Russia had already been um, testing information warfare broadly all across the former Soviet states. They, they'd done that um, in Ukraine quite extensively, um, in Lithuania and Latvia and Poland. Um, and so they kind of knew what they were doing. And this is the point at which I believe they transitioned that energy and they said, okay, we need to do something to undermine the legitimacy of democracy in the Western world. NATO was the closest thing, the most threatening body that, that they had on a, you know, on a regular basis that they were interacting with. And that actually NATO had, had, when it was founded, it originally agreed that it wouldn't go closer than, um, I think it was further east than a, certain, than a certain space, and they had actually already gone past that. So Putin was feeling pretty cornered, and he didn't really know what to do. But he did have this really epic information warfare capability that he'd been building up over the last couple of years. And he also had this really epic cyber warfare capability, which he'd been building up over the last couple of years. Um, and that's the point at which uh, Russia unleashed this whole surge of weaponry, not just on the United States, but also across Europe. So... We're not going to talk about the, the cyber war part of it today. I'm happy to talk with you guys later about that if you'd like. But um, I want to make sure that we understand that this whole information network and this whole information warfare problem that we're dealing with, it's not just about fake news. It's a hybrid human-machine political botnet, and it has extremely global ambitions. So this is a map of, of the world. Um, and this represents kind of like right after the election, right? So um, you see you got Breitbart has an office in L.A. and Texas, although it's kind of off the side. Um, Cambridge Analytica has an office in New York. Breitbart and Cambridge both have offices in London because, fun fact, they both were involved in Brexit. Um, uh, Breitbart has an office in Jerusalem. And then Russia has a couple of different information propaganda and uh, information warfare and propaganda campaigns taking place across the Soviet, the Soviet bloc. Um, so the first thing that, that happened right after the election, Breitbart opened offices in France and Germany with the goal of manipulating and, uh, and changing the, the outcome of those two elections. Um, and then Cambridge Analytica expanded their reach quite a bit. Um, they're now running Trump's re-election campaign in the United States. Um, and are already using these same, same techniques to keep his, his base kind of in line and, and uh, faithful to him. Um, they also opened offices in India. They, they were involved in the Kenyan election, which was just overturned because there were 5 million Ill illegitimate votes. Um, and they're, they're considering um, working in Australia. I think they might, at this point, may have been shut out of that, but that was one of the things they wanted to do. And then they're also deploying broadly across South America because there were very few, unlike here in Europe, there are very few data the personal data protections there. So no one's really paying attention to what they're doing or with whom. Um, and it's unlikely that, you know, as happened in the United States, people would get upset if they found out what was going on um, and try and, you know move things along or return things to the way they were. So, um, and then Russia actually was also involved in uh, Germany and, and in the French election. They've successfully hacked into Macron's email. Um, Macron uh, did this really smart thing where he created a honeypot. Uh, so he made all these fake emails ahead of time because he knew that would probably happen. Uh, he had this far alt-right uh, opponent. And so when they found all the emails, he was then able to say, like, you don't know which of those are real or which of them are not real. Um, and France did something pretty interesting, at least from the perspective of, of uh, an American cit or a U.S. citizen, um, which is they actually banned any media company from reporting on any of the emails 
and they said, if anyone posts these emails, we're going to arrest you. Um, so this is, this is a widespread issue. Um, and we published this article about this in February. When we did BuzzFeed at the time, it was still pretty early on in this. A lot of this has now been kind of reported on, and, and it's a lot more well understood. Um, but BuzzFeed immediately wrote two articles calling us conspiracy theorists, citing Republican operatives, which we took as a sign that we were on the right track. Um, luckily, Pierre uh, came, came to our defense. Um, and said something that is absolutely true. And so one of the things that's important to remember about all of this is that this stuff sounds scary, and there are like many global ambitions of these that these humans have who are behind this campaign, but there's actually nothing illegal about it. It's really mostly just marketing applied to politics for the first time. And so that's part of the reason that in the United States it's been so hard to respond, right? We're, we've been having all of these hearings with, with platform companies and trying to figure out, you know, lawmakers are, are frustrated because they feel like the platform companies aren't responding enough. Um, platform companies and Silicon Valley community is frustrated because they feel like there are bad ideas coming through from lawmakers. Um, but as a result of this article, a lot of things started to happen. So I was invited to go to the Brussels Forum to debate the, Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister of Sweden about whether or not the internet is a force for democracy. Um, my co-founder was invited to brief the Senate Intelligence Committee in the United States. Um, the article has been read more than a million times now. It was cited by the New York Times, UNHCR, the World Bank, Forbes, um, and a lot of others. And we know it was personally circulated at Google um, by Eric Schmidt. And it was also cited by Tim Berners-Lee as one of the three biggest challenges facing the internet in his article about this on, its, on the 28th anniversary. So I bring all this up not, not to brag, although I am proud of all of the impact that this one article has had. Um, but I bring it up because the more that we talk to these people, um, and the more that we were, you know, connecting with high-level political analysts and political strategists and top technologists, the clearer it became to us that there were a lot of really small, fragmented technological responses, but there really wasn't anything that was going to be able to compete with this global network. And in a sense, like a lot of these kind of like fact-checking bots and, and systems, it's really like we're bringing a knife to a space laser fight, and that's not going to work. Um, so as, as a result, we have actually um, decided that we have begun building a comprehensive strategic response out of Scout to protect democracy in the age of computational propaganda. Um, and I'm happy to talk more with all of you about what that means in person. Um, but we've been working on it now for several months. Um, and the most important thing to know about all of this is that we here right now, it's easy for us all to kind of like go about our daily lives and just pretend like everything's going to be fine and Facebook's going to create some changes that mean that this isn't really a problem anymore. And, um, you know, maybe they will be able to fix some of the political advertising problems. Um, but how do you control information that isn't fake, right? Because a lot of this isn't fake. Some of it is just true facts applied to manipulate huge swaths of people. Um, and this is only going to get more complicated as we move into fields like... Um, artificial intelligence, as that adapts and gets better. I mean, even since the last election, we can now make AI-generated videos uh, that just spin themselves up out of nothing, right? Um, we can now fake a person's appearance on video in a way that you can't actually tell whether you're looking at that person saying something or if you're looking at a simulation of that person saying this thing. And so this raises a lot of questions about truth and free will and what it means to make choices in a free society when you know that all of the information that you're getting could be really just an extension of someone trying to create a broader political change. We, at this moment, are living through an unprecedented cyber attack 
on Western democracy, free will, and cultural cohesion. And solving this problem is going to require elite machine learning, automated marketing, and cybersecurity talent to work with political strategists in ways that the technology community and the civics community and policy community have never done before, right? Because we really fundamentally speak different languages from one another. Um, so I want to just finish this up by saying that the reason that I came here today, the reason that I flew, I live in Seattle. The reason that I flew all the way across, you know, halfway across the world, in addition to Stefan being a really wonderful, uh, you know, in, invitation giver, um, is that <laughs> the world really needs you guys right now. Um, and I say that uh, not, just, not just because you know, you're here now in front of me, but this specific community of technologists and developers um, and the extended DevOps community as well, we need you guys to dive in and get your hands dirty and to figure out what to do about this, to help us figure out what to do about this. And the cool thing about doing this, I've been doing it for a while, it's actually really fun. Um, in the process, you'll be exposed to the most important developments in technology and psychology, both new insights and economic opportunities. It's a huge problem. Um, and hopefully, who knows, maybe you'll even be able to get over some of that social anxiety along the way. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Barrett. Um, so if you still have a few questions or whatever, you can always come down here. We, we can still open up the floor a bit. But now in 15 minutes, the, the movie will start. So just mm -hmm. gently go out of the room if you want to see the movie. Get some popcorn as well while doing so. Keep in mind, the movie is two hours and 43 minutes. So it's a long movie. And otherwise, we'll see each other tomorrow morning for the next sessions. Mm -hmm.